Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You are going to hear a customer inquiring about different types of radio. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Yes, madam. How can I help you? I want to buy a radio. It's a present for my daughter. One moment, madam. I'll show you what models we have in stock. Thank you. Uh, this one's very popular. The Club Tropicana. The Club Tropicana. <laughs> it's certainly very colorful, isn't it? The colors are very popular with children. It comes in pink, orange, and green. Oh, yes, I think she'd like that. <laughs> and it's got a CD player and a clock. Does the clock have an alarm? My daughter is terrible at getting up in the mornings. <laughs> yes, it does. It's a bit big. That's because it has four built-in speakers, madam. How much is it? Well, it usually retails at $59.99, but it's on special offer this week. So I could let you have it for $39.99. $39.99? Hmm, not bad. Anything else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. There certainly is. Uh, introducing our top-of-the-range model, the Night Owl. Available only in black, but packed with extra features. Such as? A clock, and it has a television, complete with 10-centimeter screen, and... And this makes it perfect for the bedside table, a built-in reading light. Very clever. <laughs> yes. It's ideal for use both indoors and out. The batteries last for a hundred hours. Sounds good. Who's it made by? Parker, madam. They're a British company. Very good quality. Parker? Hmm. How much is this one? $79.99 plus tax. That's a bit expensive. Do you have anything cheaper? Uh, here. This is the cheapest, smallest, and lightest one we do. It's tiny. <laughs> and it's round. That's really unusual. Yep. It's called the Olympic. You wear it round your neck with this special strap. See? Oh, it's like a medal. An Olympic medal. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's gold. And you get a free pair of headphones so you can listen to it wherever you are. And you never have to replace the batteries. Really? Uh, why not? There aren't any. Oh? It runs on solar power. Does it really? And I suppose it's expensive. $18, madam. I'll take it. Certainly, madam.
Now, cash, check, or credit card? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear someone giving instructions to staff at a festival. First, look at questions 11 to 13. As you listen to the first part of the interview... Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Castle Pop Festival. My name is Sandy, and I'm the General Manager of Castle Pop Entertainments, and I just want to take a few moments to mention a few things to you before you go and have your detailed briefings in your work groups. Uh, you all have a copy of the plan of the festival grounds. Now, most things are obvious, but I'd like to point out first the visitor toilets here along the side of the main area. Kindly do not use these yourselves. Your own facilities, the staff toilets, are beside the breakfast tent. Also, there are public telephones behind the stage. I mention these two things because they are places that visitors often ask for. For yourselves, one of the most important places is the staff meeting point. This is new this year, and the only thing to remember is that it exists and that when you refer to a meeting point between yourselves, you need to make clear which one you are talking about. The staff meeting point is between Campsite 1 and the Disabled Viewing Area. This is not marked on the general maps, but it is marked on the maps you've got there. The visitors' meeting point is, as you can see, in the centre of the main area, between the breakfast tent and the entrance. Now, another important facility is the first aid tent. This is a big round tent, so you can't miss it. It's on the right-hand side of the entrance, again as you come in. There are many other first aid facilities all over the festival site. In fact, there is a first aid box in every tent and sales point, but this is the central point. Finally, I wanted to mention the security on the site. Every year the festival gets bigger and bigger, and so every year we have to increase the security arrangements. We have a number of small security offices, one being near the entrance, but the main security office is opposite the disabled viewing area. It's next to the Old England pub so that the officers can keep an eye on what's going on there. And of course, in that office, there is a full supply of first aid equipment too. And don't forget, those of you who can't wait till you get your pay at the end of the festival, there are some cash machines in the wall of the Old England pub. Now look at questions 14 to 20. As the interview continues, complete the sentences. I do hope you will enjoy working with us this year. It's always good to see some of last year's faces back with us again. 
We hope this year to put on an even better festival than before. The first year we put on a festival, we called it the Mountain View Pop Concert. And it was a pop concert rather than a festival. We held it inside the castle and you could see the mountains in the background. It was very small and personal. Then we held it in front of the castle with the castle in the background and then we started calling it the Castle Festival. Now, this year, we have moved further away into the fields. The advantage is that the castle and the mountains are both there in the distance, but we have as much space as we want in the fields. The only problem with the fields is that sheep use the fields during the spring months and they leave little messages for us all over the place. So please be careful and encourage the visitors to be careful too. Now, it just remains for me to let you know the times of your detailed briefings, which are as follows, and I'm telling you these as they are not, I repeat, not as written down on your welcome letters. Those of you who are working on the children's zone, your meeting is at 2pm in Campsite 2. Those of you on the security team need to meet behind the stage at 3.15 p.m. For the people on first aid, please do not meet in the first aid tent. There will not be enough room. But meet at the entrance gates at 4 p.m. Finally, we need everybody, and I do mean everybody, on duty on Monday morning at 8 a.m. for the final clean-up. I'd like to remind you that Monday is the final day of work, not the Sunday. People not coming to the final day will lose 50% of their pay. The meeting place for that is Campsite 1. Now, good luck and let's make this the best festival ever! That is the end of part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a tutor and a student talking about the history of the scientific method. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Simon. Come in. Take a seat. Now, I wanted to talk to you about your assignment. Yes, the one on the scientific method. That's right. I just wanted to see how you were getting on. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I haven't done a huge amount of work on it because I've been working on other things. But what I've read so far seems fine. How many of the references that I gave you have you managed to get hold of? Not too many, I'm afraid. It seems that everyone else is working on the same things at the same time. And every time I look, the books are checked out from the library. Right. Well, I think that we can go over the main ground together now. That way, even if you don't manage to go through all the references in detail, you'll still have an overview. What has helped you most so far? I've managed to have a look at three of them. I thought that Johnson made some good points, but it was hard to follow the line of her argument. Bradman was simple and straightforward, and I felt as if I got a lot out of that. I wish I could say the same for Whitaker. To be honest, I didn't get very far with that. 
OK, that's more or less what I'd expect. So tell me, what have you learned so far about the role of the Egyptians and the Babylonians? Yes. Well, there's evidence that the basic components of the scientific method, examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, were being used in the early 1600s BC, especially in the treatment of certain illness. Good. Yes, that's right. And the point, of course, is that that represented a considerable advance over relatively simple, non-empirical approaches, which usually attributed anything unknown to the actions of the gods, etc. Of course, the Egyptians and Babylonians did this as well, but what we see emerging here is a willingness to base opinion on systematic study of the real world, which is at the root of the scientific method. I see. Right, yes. And then that reappears later. Yes, although don't get carried away with the idea that it was a simple process of development. By the time we get to ancient Greece, let's take the period towards the middle of the 5th century BC, the rules governing the scientific method were practiced on a widespread scale, but there were still many people who believed that real truth could only be acquired by pure rational thought. Plato, of course, had a great influence on the development of the scientific method during this period. Through his academy. That's right. But then, as we know, a great deal of understanding of the scientific method disappeared as the old world order collapsed. It wasn't until the Middle Ages, sometime before the 11th century, that several versions of the scientific method emerged from the medieval Muslim world, all of which stressed the importance of experimentation in science. Right. I think I've got the historical timeline. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The other thing I'm struggling with slightly is actually pinning down precisely what we mean by the scientific method. I wonder if you could give me some pointers on that. Sure. Well, it's best to think of the scientific method as a series of steps in a process which allows us to find answers to questions about the world around us. So the first step is to identify the problem. What is it that you want to know or explain? And then I think the next step is designing an experiment. Hmm. But you can't design an experiment unless you know what you want your experiment to tell you. Oh, yes. You need to form a hypothesis to be tested before you design the experiment. So, there's a very clear relationship between hypothesis and experiment. Having designed the experiment, then of course you go on to carry out the experiment. The particular procedure you follow, the protocol, will differ from experiment to experiment, but the underlying principle is the same. You analyse the data from the experiment in order to confirm or disprove your hypothesis. Assuming the experiment is accurate. Oh, yes. If there's anything unusual about the data, or if the results are at all surprising, then you need to ask yourself whether the experiment could be flawed and whether the data could be unreliable. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to modify the experiment and go through the process again. So, once you have reliable, valid results, then the final step is to communicate them. The wider scientific community needs to know about the results, and publication in journals is the accepted way. OK. I think I've got the basics. It's going to get more complicated as we begin to look at some people who have criticised the scientific method. So you need to make sure that you understand things up to this point. Let me know if you have any further problems with it.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about stray cats. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully to the talk and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening. I'd like to introduce Laura Dongswell of the Feral Cat Association. Laura has just returned from spending three months in Italy, where she has been working with local organisations to improve conditions for some of the estimated one and a half million ownerless cats currently thought to be at large there. Thank you very much. The principal problem regarding this issue is much the same in Italy as it is in other countries: public awareness. The general public have become so used to the sight of ownerless cats in poor condition wandering their streets that they simply don't recognise it as a problem. While some will put out scraps of food, the majority see feral cats in much the same light as, say, seagulls, a form of local wildlife which is of no particular concern to or responsibility of the human population. Of course, there are plenty of individuals who do take responsibility for cats in their areas, providing appropriate food, emergency veterinary treatment, and perhaps indoor shelter. But these people can only provide support for a fraction of the vast numbers of feral cats that exist. So, what's to be done? Find loving family homes for all feral cats. Well, that would be wonderful, of course, but unlikely to happen any time soon. The two main focuses of our work are sterilisation and education. Sterilisation is usually only performed on female animals. It may seem a drastic intervention, but it benefits both the sterilised cats who will not have to suffer the health consequences of endless pregnancies, and also the feral cat population as a whole, as controlling numbers reduces competition for whatever slender resources of food may exist. Animals to be neutered are captured and sedated at the point of capture to minimise their stress and discomfort. They are then taken to a temporary centre set up by a local organisation, and the operations are carried out under anaesthetic by trained veterinary surgeons, all of whom kindly donate their time. Now, while domestic cats can recuperate in the comfort of their owners' homes, feral cats have no such luxury. They are kept at the centre for around twenty-four hours, then returned to the locality from which they came. Dissolving stitches are used, and each cat that has been operated on has the tip of one ear clipped, a sign that the animal has already been neutered. A few animals have been electronically tagged, and their progress monitored. In general, it has been found that neutering does not diminish an animal's chances of survival. On the contrary, the evidence suggests that sterilised females have a significantly improved chance of remaining in adequate health. The other focus of our work is, as I said. Education, 
publicising the issue and raising awareness. Our current poster campaign is a translation of the widely used slogan, A kitten is not just for Christmas. At present, resources are rather limited, but, funds permitting, a campaign of radio advertisements is planned, perhaps in the run-up to next Christmas, reminding people that families may quickly become bored with the responsibility of owning a domestic animal. Last year, we used newspaper ads featuring pictures of emaciated strays and highlighting the fact that abandoning an animal simply transfers your problem to somebody else. Which leads me on to the final point I'd like to make. Organisations such as ours are sometimes depicted as being mainly for sentimental animal lovers. Well, I make no apology for that but our work has a wider importance than the welfare of cats. Ownerless cats tend to quickly fall into ill health and can become a health hazard in various ways, including the spreading of disease and parasites. Children can be especially vulnerable to this, as they are more likely to handle an infected or infested animal. Thank you very much, Laura. That is the end of part four. That's the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.